ghillie. My grandfather was a ghillie. My granduncle was a ghillie. And my great grandfather was a ghillie. This was bandit country, which was really accessible only by sea. Even today, you know, the, the roads approach through mountain passes. And imagine before a road system, uh, this era area was a fairly inaccessible, uh, wild place. I'm giving you all the attitude to feel like this. You never know. Sea talk fishing is an unusual game, like. But certainly from time to time you run into a fish of a lifetime, and, you know, it's always the case of the one that got away. A life spent fishing. Every day catching fish on the water and surrounded by some of Kerry's most scenic landscapes. It seems like a job that few could resist. However, the life of a ghillie, the name for a full-time fishing guide, is of course much more than that of rose-tinted glasses. It is a job of many factors and facets, from guiding clients to the upkeep of the fishery, as well as protecting the future of Kerry's fishing environment. The life of a ghillie is rooted in the traditions of its past, the reality of the present, and the hopes and fears for the future. Is it a way of life that is in danger of being lost to modern habits and times, however? And what are the pressing challenges that lie ahead for those men and women who foster and care for Kerry's fishing waters? In A Gilly's Life, we'll hear from the lives of three full-time guides, all with very different stories and backgrounds. From the carpenter turned fishery manager, the fourth generation Gilly, and the Welsh coal miner, fishing is their life. We'll find out just what makes their local waters so unique their history and importance in the Kerry Loran environment, as well as their efforts to make sure that fishing for salmon, sea trout and bass in Kerry remains some of the best, not only in the county and the country, but Europe as well. Our journey begins just off the N70 as we come into Waterville. The tourists might be drawn to the spectacular Atlantic coastline as the coaches weave their way around the Ring of Kerry, but nestled just a few miles inland lies a spectacular lake that many are even unaware of. Loch Coran, or Loch Leoch to give it its original name, is one of the finest sea trout lakes in Europe, with visiting anglers coming from far and wide to fish its waters. Coran has always had a special place for the local community living near its shores, providing as it did in years gone by food and commerce through its supply of salmon and sea trout. And even in Celtic mythology it was a place of renown, as poet and writer Paddy Bush explains. The original Gaelic invaders uh, the Miletians landed here in Balanskelly's Bay and Loch Coran, or as it was then known, Loch Ligdach, later Loch Leoch, uh, was a central place in that um, Celtic, Gaelic uh, imagination. And uh, even the original song of Amergan, whom Amergan, their leader, uh, which he recited as he stepped ashore, one of the lines in that may bradan selin in a salmon in a pool and having made the claim to the area the next thing he did was um, to recite a poem which was conjuring as it were salmon into the bay and into the lake so obviously the people who set the invasion myth in this area were very conscious that the salmon was central to the imaginative life of the place if you like but i think that imaginative life is really just a reflection of the actual everyday and uh, even economic life one family who has long been on the shores of Quran, though maybe not quite as long as the celts and who are synonymous with fishing on the lake are the o'shea's with neil o'shea now fourth generation gilly guiding anglers around the waters for nine months of the year my father was a gilly. My grandfather was a gilly. My granduncle was a gilly. And my great grandfather was a gilly. And then if we step to my mother's side of it, my uncle was a gilly here. He was a gilly here for over 50 years. And my grandfather was, on my mother's side was a gilly as well. Would they have been full time gillies or did you use it as a way to supplement income? Well, you see, all of them would have been basically full-time gillies as such as it, as it allows because you see the season starts on the 17th of January and goes on till the 12th of October and um, I suppose if you go back to the time of my grandfather uh, in the early parts of it in January and February they'd troll themselves for salmon and they'd sell the salmon and as times moved on, then the same you got to Easter, the fishing clients started to come in then, like, and then they'd be fishing with them 
and I don't both their clientele and my present clientele would be probably 65% of them would be repeat clients every year or miss a year or come again but generally my whole business would be dealing with repeat, repeat clients and their business would have been the same and even back then like you know if we're talking 30 40 50 years ago more even if we wanted to check. yeah go right back like what were the kind of clientele back then that used to come fishing was it a very kind of um wealthy kind of class was it a, where well, did they come from they a lot of them came from england and you had a lot of people from ireland as well but it was mainly english retired people at the time like you know and you know you would always hear people saying that water is very far away to get from but after the the first world's war and after the second world's war it was an arm, army like some of them army clientele that had retired were coming from england like and spending two weeks here and three weeks here and fishing every day like and, and how did they they'd get i suppose get the boat over to to dublin was it or then? Or to park i suppose yeah. as well like and then it was after ross Lair, i don't know what the time mm-hmm. where then by train down to cash and then if you go back to the time and then if you come to the time of, of uh, the ferries, like they'd be driving from England, like. True, true. Yeah. Uh, and even was it busy back then? Do you know, from years busy. In fact, maybe busy. I mean, it was all based around the hotels. Then you had the Butler Arms Hotel and the Southern Lake Hotel, and all the clientele that were coming in were coming in directly to them, and the gillies were working through them, like. Where at the present day, the whole thing has changed. Now it's the gillies that are bringing them in. Just direct contact with the gillies that are bringing the anglers in the 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 hotels and done, you know. I was supposed to be that, isn't it? Because of the internet and oh all yeah, that all that, yeah, you can have yeah. your own website and people. Can I mean, that's all. That's that's what it is at the moment. No, everything is coming through the website, like and and uh, you know, even in my early days, it was all phone calls and you know, written things like that. That's gone. It's all emails and all texting and. Oh, yeah, all digital. All digital, yes. Like, it's no problem for a fellow from London to ring me in outside in the middle of the lake, see what the fishing is like. From the heyday, where so many gillies were being employed by hotels in the area to cater for the visiting anglers, the numbers now guiding full-time on Koran has fallen dramatically to perhaps no more than half a dozen. There have been many changes affecting the demand for gillies, not least with the internet, but also going back to the introduction of outboard motors on boats in the 1960s. At that time, it was all done by rowing, like. It was in the late 60s at the first of the uh, outboard motors, the engines came in there. And then, uh, you get, you, 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 you started to get another situation there, then where uh, people would have a, private boats would be, uh, started to come into the scene, where there was no such thing as private boats before, they were all gilly-driven boats, like. And then, as they passed on, some of the people that were with them bought their own boat rather than going down the ghillie line again. Well, at the present day, we're probably about 10 ghillies there, like, in total, like. Would you be one of the few full-time? Uh, there's five or six of them full of time enough, yeah. But, uh, you see, then you've got another situation there where we, where the Donnellys on the other side of the lake and the Sullivans next door here in North South started to get self-drive boats. We supply the boat and the engine and everything and they just hire it from us for the day and we, they're self, you know. And you tended to get, what you tended to start to get then was you get guys coming down who would regularly fish the carob or the mask or shielding or any of these. They'd come for a weekend here or they'd come for three days again and they'd hire the, hire the boat like. One thing has remained constant and that is the method and means of catching fish. For Loch Coran has a strong tradition and past with fly fishing. There was always a long tradition of fly fishing here. Mm. I mean, I talked to my grandfather and my great, well, I never met my great grandfather, like my grandfather, but they were all into fly fishing. They were all very well able to fly fish. Like. It, it was all part of it, like, I mean, you know, uh, there was always a part of it, there was always people came here specifically to fly fish. Mm. As for saying, I don't, I, uh, you can't say it was invented here, like, but I mean, like, it is there as long as any type of Angler came here. And is, is, it, is it regarded as the best way to catch? I don't mean most pleasing, but the most effective way. For sea trout it is. Mm-hmm. The most effective way to catch sea trout, yeah. You were in the premiership when you were here, like, <laughs> and, and, and the top of it as well. The elusive sea trout, 
or white trout as it is also known in Ireland. As a fish it's probably ranked behind salmon and brown trout in terms of people's knowledge for it is a fish that is elusive and hard to catch. In many fisheries, especially on rivers in Wales, sea trout can only be caught at night time such as the fish's wariness in the water. But Curran is different. Curran has gained a reputation as Ireland's premier sea trout water, especially if you want to catch a record size, as Neil O'Shea explains. It's such a famous lake for large sea trout. And also, if you go through the sea trout scene, like and you go to the lakes of Wales, where they have very, very large sea trout as well in parts of Scotland, and a lot of the river fishing for sea trout is done at night, like we're here. It's all done during the day. We have social sea trout, social hour sea trout. And then the possibility is like of catching a very large sea trout. Like there was a man fishing with me from Yorkshire, Sean Smith. He caught him, he was 13 pounds, 5 ounces. He was the biggest sea trout caught in Ireland. Or the biggest sea trout ever caught on fly in Ireland. The sea trout is a migratory fish. He comes to the he comes to the to the fresh water to, to breed, like, and it's just we try to intercept him in his way. The thing with the salmon is that he migrates and he does one winter at sea like and he returns and as a grills and the salmon and the, uh, if he does a multi winter fish they call him maybe two winters at sea he returns as a spring salmon where the sea trout do the same thing but they don't migrate as far when, when some, some of the sea trout smalls migrate in um, let's say April and May like a lot of those would only stay at sea for 68 weeks and return in it at a pound or a pound and a half, pound and a half would be a good one. Like. But then the ones that will go on and stay that winter at sea will return the following May, then it that can be two or two and a half pounds. And they tend to, to the bigger ones, you know, the ones that you get up to, uh, say the ones that you can get, say a specimen sea trout in Ireland is six pounds. And the fish that are larger than that would be multi winter fish that migrate a couple of times or even three times. Like I was going to have to get out onto the water and see if I could catch an elusive sea trout, and even better yet, a record sized one. But on this September day, looking out from the hut beside the water's edge, the wind was whipping up a gale and white horses were chasing each other from bay to bay. The rain continued to lash down on the cargot roof, and we decided instead to put the kettle on and wait it out while I had time to catch up with another man whose life was spent full time on another water in Kerry on the Upper Carra fishery. The Upper Carra is considered one of Ireland's finest salmon rivers and lies nestled amongst the McGillicuddy Reeks in the heart of Kerry. Privately owned by a Swiss architect, the system lets out its seven beats on a daily basis. The man responsible for the upkeep, guiding and running of the fishery is Mike O'Shea, no relation to Neil who explained to me his life and work on this water and how he came to be a full-time ghillie. Growing up, I suppose, my first experience of fishing was draft net fishing in Castleman Harbour with my father. There was a traditional salmon fishery and there still is a traditional salmon fishery there. Not to the same extent it was then. Yeah, growing up, I was always around the, around the strand and my first salmon, I suppose, experience of seeing salmon was in the draft net with my father over the years, you know, and numbers of salmon that time were... Obviously, they're like higher there now. Talk to me a bit about actually the the draft netting. It was it was a way of life for people. It wasn't it wasn't something that you did for hobby fishing. Fishing was was how you earned your money then, wasn't it? Absolutely. I mean, the fishermen in Cremorne that time there must there could have been anything up to forty to fifty fishermen fishing with small timber boats, um, relatively low impact. But there was a lot of them there, and they made their living. I suppose the price of salmon that time were good. They fished that time from January right through, right through until uh, I think August, mm-hmm. and uh, the fishing was spectacular. I mean, I can remember substantial numbers of fish being caught. Maybe sometimes not by ourselves, but you would actually ever see other boats getting a lot of fish. Yeah. And would the fish then be sent on to, to London as a Billingsgate? Was this? Was yeah, the place, they were sold locally to. Uh, I think the main buyer at the time would have been Cremorne Seafoods. Um, he obviously exported them further on to Billingsgate and there was a lot of smoke. The fish were smoked, obviously, and sent abroad at Christmas to various various buyers. But, yeah, it was a thriving industry. When then did you kind of start picking up the fly rod, maybe, and get into that side of fishing? Because well, it's I, a very different for a different side of it. Like Well, where I'm from in Cremorne, there was a small lake, and I suppose I started fishing there first, initially for trout with a few worms, and like all children do and kids. And I can always remember my father saying, put that rod away, you'll never get nothing out of that rod. It's just ironic to think after that I ended up getting a very good job out of that rod and came went on to become the, the manager of the Upper Cara. You know, you have this persona by commercial netsman, 
I suppose there probably is netsmen out there who do a bit of angling, but at the time, I remember my father saying, you know, uh, it was them against the rodmen. You know, that was the way it is looked at, and it's probably still looked at. That that perception is still there by some communities, but no, I mean, he never he never had a rod in his hand. Maybe the odd time for a few mackerel if we were on the sea somewhere, but obviously, you know... Never, never for real enjoyment. Mm-hmm. Not like me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and then so. you kind of went. So then you started getting into it more and more. And but did it become? It was more a hobby for you, obviously. Cause it you became growing. a hobby. Yeah, it became a hobby. We used to, I used to cycle from. Uh, I lived near near the mouth of the Cara there, and we, I used to cycle back there as young uh, as a young fella with the rod tied onto the the bar of the bike back for a few sea trout in the evening. Or you know, if you were if you were lucky enough to have a salmon, you know, a salmon that time for a young boy was a major deal. With I can't recall catching too many salmon, but certainly a lot of a lot of sea trout and a lot of brown trout. Um, and then after after maybe secondary level school and moving on, serving my time as a carpenter, I was living away from home and I fished around different rivers around Kerry then and got to know a bit more about salmon fishing. When did it kind of come into your head, or was it ever a career plan, or was it something that happened by accident that you ended up full time in, in uh, as a gilly? It a kind boy? of did happen by accident. It kind of fell into my lap, to be honest with you. Um, as going going through work and having a few more pounds to spare, um, being qualified as a carpenter, we started fishing different places, and one of those places would have been the Upper Cara. I got to know the manager there. Um, his name was Vincent, Vincent Doshier, no relation of mine. Um, started fishing there. Obviously you're seeing that you can fish and you can catch a few fish. And there would have been a lot of guests going through their books at the time and still is. And he just coincidence one day he asked me, would I be interested to take a couple of these older guys out in the boat? I'd have had a lot of experience with the boat coming from Cremont and plenty of experience catching a few fish now and again. So I kind of said, yeah, I wouldn't mind that. So one or two days guiding for him, for different people. And it just progressed from there. I said, listen, if you ever need a hand, you know where I am. And, you know, he offered me more and more days, weekends especially, and then maybe maybe his work might have been busy at different stages. I was off during the week, and I, st- I was building my own house at the time. 13 years ago, I was building my own house, and he just approached me one evening. He said, there's a part-time job there available. Would you would you be interested? And I would. He since went on to retire, and he offered me the job as manager, and I've, I've, I've been there 13 years since. So right place at the right time. Right place at the right time. For someone with such a love of fishing, fly fishing especially, such an opportunity for Mike O'Shea was nothing short of a dream job. I mean, I loved as a young fella being out even on the strand with my father, and it's nice too to be out on the river fishing. And it, like, I suppose I didn't appreciate it when I got the job, of course. But th- now, looking back at the last 10 to 12, 13 years, yeah, it is a dream job. I mean, I have a lot of friends around, and they're saying I'm like a professional footballer. You get up every morning to go fishing. That's not always the case, but of course, a big part of my job is fishing. Uh, a lot of fishing, maybe not every day, but certainly, definitely, 50% of the time would be to do with fishing and fishing with people. Tell me just uh, what your job entails, because you're a fisheries manager, so it's obviously there's many different aspects of that. Maybe you can might explain, people might understand exactly what a fisheries manager does. Well, being a private fisher, the Upper Cara, um the fishery consists of uh, three, three private lakes, Loch Ray, Clune Lake, and Loch Akous. Um We have also access to Carra Lake, private access to Carra Lake. We have over 20 boats on those three to four lakes, and there's a lot of maintenance in 20 boats. There's a lot of maintenance as well on the walkways and bridgeways and uh, casting platforms for anglers, grass cutting, just general running of the fishery, dealing with booking, dealing with people, uh, I suppose the previous manager, one of his biggest issues was before he retired was the amount of uh, paperwork that was being involved with r- running a running a business or running a fishery. Because if you like, when there's nobody around, I've, the whole thing lies on me. You're filling in forms. You're on the on the internet now. Everything is internet and filling in um, applications for various various applications to county councils, IFI, you know. F- different things so I mean there's a lot of paperwork involved and yeah just a daily running it's it's it takes quite a bit and I have a guy with me there three days a week um helping me out as well so I mean it's quite busy they say the most successful salmon anglers are the wealthiest and fishing for salmon in any part of the world and especially on prime fishing beats can be an expensive holiday for the upper car which attracts a large overseas clientele they've never seen their numbers drop maintaining relationships with anglers over decades and even generations. I suppose having a lot of overseas anglers 
over the last number of years, those anglers are still coming to us. A lot of them have moved, have fished the river for 30 to 40 years, and I'm not exaggerating by saying that. Some of them have been there with their grandfathers and are now bringing their own grandchildren. Um, I suppose, if you like, over the boom, it didn't really affect us, and it hasn't affected us since it passed. These guys are obviously um, recession-proof, if that's the word to use. They had, they're semi-retired, coming from overseas, England, France, Germany, Switzerland, some Americans, and of course we have a lot of Irish fishing the river as well. And yeah, I think people will always find time to spend money on a quality product if you have a nice bit of fishing to offer them. You know, they might mightn't go fishing as often, but when they do go fishing, they'll come to places like us where they know it's been managed properly and looked after, and they'll get the rewards. You know. Whilst the upkeep of the fishery and client satisfaction is of paramount importance, there is one thing that is outside of Mike O'Shea's control, and that is the weather. With climate change causing more extreme weather, from the drought of 2013 to increased rainfall, it does all have an impact on the rivers and the fishing. You can't really plan for the weather. Nobody knows when they make a booking. If you make a booking in January and you want to come in mid-July or mid-June to come fishing to, to, to Cara, you can't guarantee that the water levels are going to be there. Cara is probably a unique fishery that we have a couple of lakes. So if you do arrive and the, the water levels in the river itself are low, you have the backup of the lakes to go fishing in. To plan to plan for weather is, is something, I suppose, fishery managers can't do. They just hope that it'll be, a f- of course, we like to have fine weather as well, but you hope that you have a, a mixture of both, especially for people who come and invest a lot of money um, booking flights, renting cars, accommodation, guides, fishing licenses. You know, I mean, they invest a lot of money locally and you hope that they can have a good time when they're here. Obviously, you hope that they have a, a, a good chance to catch a fish and weather conditions have a big bearing on that. And that, that is for sure. But to plan, to plan for the weather is something unfortunately out of my control. Yeah. Do you think, though, in terms of um, the environment... You know, do you think is it having an effect on runs that we're saying even not just Cara but generally overall in Ireland? Do you think there is a detrimental impact that's happening? I think that um, environmentally it would probably be the biggest factor on the runs of fish, certainly in the spawning streams of various catchments. Um, there isn't a lot of agriculture in the Glencar Valley, but there is a lot of forestation, and um, you have to be careful with that. Um, they can have a very negative impact on the spawning, the spawning streams and the nursery areas of young salmon, and that has a not just for anglers, but that has a, bit, uh, a detrimental impact for other people as well. Like I mentioned about Cremorne, the fish that the fishermen in Cremorne who catch the fish, or in any other fishing community, those fish have to pass through Cremorne into the river and on up into the headwaters of all the systems, and it's in everybody's interest then that the, the habitat is there, not just to provide anglers with fish, but to provide the wider community with a product that can be sustainable. One way that fisheries such as Cara and Koran are trying to overcome the environmental difficulties around the wild numbers of fish has been through enhancement programmes, whereby reared juvenile fish are released to mix with and increase the already present wild numbers in the waters. To some, this is tantamount to stocked fishing, whilst there can also be issues relating to the genetic strain of the fish being released into the wild. However, Mike O'Shea explains their management of the enhancement program on the Upper Cara and how this ensures its success. There always has been a hatchery or a nursery, a nursery program in the Upper Cara. Before I started, they used to release maybe 20, 30,000 unfed fry, which are the juvenile, the very juvenile little baby salmon, out into the headwaters of the Cara. Um, I furthered that and with the help of um, the IFI and the uh, Department of Marine, we went on to produce, we set up a small hatchery there where we rear maybe 10 to 20,000 salmon smalls every year, which we release into the Cara. This helps, this helps nature. It's just, it's just a helping hand of nature. There's people out there too far and against hatcheries for us. It has a positive effect. It has a good public relations effect. When people come, they see that you're working to provide them with a product that they can have a better chance of catching fish. And has, it also has a, the upper Cara is a private fishery, but it flows into Cara Lake, which is a public fishery. So by us maintaining a constant 
um, release of salmon smolts over the years, and we have seen it's definitely holding holding true because the the runs of salmon in the Kerala system over the years haven't dwindled at all and I'd like to think that the hatchery has something to do with that. It's also providing fishing for the general community. Anybody can go to Kerala Lake with a salmon license and go fishing and have a chance of catching a salmon. We like to think that we're providing that as well for the wider community so yeah it is um, definitely with a hatchery, with our hatchery I have to say it certainly has a positive effect on the car. Uh, but people do have, uh, pe- some people do oppose it in some circles. Um, I suppose the biggest argument with hatcheries would be genetics, um, taking in stock from other rivers into the likes of the Cara River and um, buying in stock from other fisheries even outside of Ireland, it has been over the years. People have brought fish in from various various different regions. We don't do that. We go and we catch the brood stock themselves while they're spawning in the headwaters of the Cara. We maybe take 10 to 15 female fish. Um, we, we strip the eggs, fertilize the eggs, and hold the eggs in trays. And they are, car- they are Cara salmon. Genetics hasn't changed. And... Um, Actually, sometimes we, we have the ability to lift a pair of fish that have naturally been selected themselves, and you can lift them, strip them, and release their their, their offspring into the wild and the headwaters of the car. Again, like I said, with the forestation and stuff, it's good that you can hold them in a hatchery and you can produce a larger amount of fish, you know, maybe that maybe wouldn't necessarily survive in the wild. Not always the case, but it certainly seems for us to have a benefit when you use your own stock. I think that's the way forward. I mean, and do you, you know, run that? You you're responsible for the, for the hatchery, the running of the hatchery. Yeah, we we run the hatchery. Um, a lot of work in running a hatchery. You know, you have to have various um, various um, licenses, um, discharge licenses from the county council. We have um, a reed bed there that treats the water before it goes back in. The, the upper car is an SAC and an NHA, and the county council monitor uh, monitor it four times a year. So everything is done above board and. Uh, I run the hatchery and control what happens in the hatchery and anybody can come along there and have a look at the hatchery. And it's also nice for for some children to come and have a look at the, the little legs developing into the alvins and alvins going into fry and all the way up along until they reach small to it. And if they're there at Christmas, they can actually see the adult fish in the tanks being stripped. And I've had a lot of kids up looking looking just to sh- teach them a little bit more about salmon they don't get the experience to see to see wild salmon you know how long are they in the hatchery before they release generally from an egg to small it is about 14 months and in the wild that may take up to three years so it does take the pressure off the off the carrot system as well in relation to um, the amount of fish that are searching for food and looking for food so you have you can have 30 40 thousand fry and we feed them artificially of course but um Nonetheless, when you release them back into the carrot, they, they migrate themselves just like the wild fish, and they come back. And we have proven, we have proven that they come back, and we catch every year quite a high percentage of our fish are from the hatchery. More and more fisheries are looking at, you know, combining the elements of having the wild stock with the hatchery there just to help things along. Are you seeing that more and more as kind of fish development generally? Like? around the country no? well I can only speak for myself and I know there's a neighbouring hatchery in Waterville who are doing similar um, what I can say maybe going back 70, 80 or even maybe 100 years ago most fisheries in the country had had a hatchery I mean the River Lawn had a hatchery there was one I think at Killarglin right in the town there was another one in, in on the, the Drenoch which is, flows into Killarney just at the entrance into Killarney there at Ballydowney Bridge there's a little hatchery there the Blackwater all these famous rivers most of these rivers had hatcheries and they were closed down over years for one reason or the other but um, the way salmon stocks are going with commercial commercial and problems with survival at sea it's hard to know really I think the way forward may be may be that um Provided you use your own genetic stock from that river, I can't see a reason why more and more hatcheries couldn't be developed to help out individual cases that need helping out. Maybe not, some rivers don't need it, but it certainly, in my view, it wouldn't have a negative effect provided it's done on a small scale. Mike O'Shea's life as a fishing guide and fishery manager was not a planned one. Like so often in life, the twists and turns lead one to a path you don't realise you were looking for all along. Throughout winter he'll be busy with the upkeep and maintenance of Upper Cara, and once the opening of another season arrives in February, the arrival of fishermen will keep him out on the water. Not a bad way to spend the working day. I like to think 
for its size, it's one of the probably one of the best fisheries in the country for its size. It is a spate river, and we are very much reliant on, on rainfall. A lot of the bigger fisheries are are, are reliant on maybe a, a lot of more and more fisheries are becoming more spatey because um, everybody now seems to have a little machine and they clean out their drains and they haven't got the hold up of water that you once had in, in a lot of these catchments. But yeah, if we have water on the Upper Cara, any time from February right through until early August, you you have a very high chance of catching a, catching a fish or two. Um, can't guarantee that, of course, but I can guarantee the chance. And for the chance of catching what may lie in the waters of Upper Cara, there's always the tale of the one that got away. The previous manor, Vin, manager, Vincent O'Shea, he was fishing in Clune Lake this year with a couple of Swiss gentlemen, and he did hook. They did hook what they initially thought was the bottom, and they they they. One of the older clients in the boat, he couldn't hold the rod in his hand for more than maybe 10 to 15 minutes, and Vincent O'Shea took the rod from him and he played what he considered to be the fish of his lifetime. Now Vincent was on that river for over 30 years and like he said to me, he said he was all his life waiting for this fish. He didn't get the fish, they lost the fish, the fish broke them off but certainly he said this fish definitely would have been in the 30 pound class. Um, from year to year there's often like a good 20 pound fish caught in the Cara system and also in the neighbouring river the Lone. but you know there is some big fish that are still going up maybe not in, not as many big fish as there once was but certainly from time to time you run into a fish of a lifetime and you know it's always the case of the one that got away After all this talk of fish and fishing finally the squall on Koran had eased just enough to head out on the water with Neil O'Shea in the hope of catching a sea trout or even a salmon on the fly Though with the wind still howling and the rain still falling heavily, he wasn't too hopeful for our chances. It's a horrible day. <laughs> it's a terrible day altogether. Um, but we're, we're here out in the lake. It's You can't see the mountains or surrounding land. It's because flat. of all the rain and the fog and everything. Exactly. We're drifting towards Church Island. We're, we're, on, we're on the southwestern side of Church Island, drifting in a southwesterly wind towards Church Island. As a shelf that runs west of Church Island, shallow reef, kind of shallow area that runs out for a long ways. We have stepped it south of it now in about 30 feet of water and we're crossing this and this will come down to about six or eight feet of water or even less in places and then we'll cross that. That goes for about 30 yards and we'll go out the other side so hopefully the fish will be on the approach as we come to it or right across it anywhere. So we're casting out and then pulling the flies in as quickly as possible, isn't it? Yeah, retrieving it. Yeah, you have to keep in touch with the flies at all times. Like. Uh, Would you be hopeful on a day like this? I'm giving you no guarantees or anything like this. You never know. Sea trout fishing is an unusual game. Like, if you just came across a couple of fresh fellas now that have been in the sea, you would get him all right. But the residents would be fairly reluctant to come today, maybe. It's interesting as well, like, on such a bad day as this, and yet we're seeing probably about half a dozen. Oh, there is, there's probably 30 more anglers here today. Yeah, which is it's a testament to either their foolhardiness or the power of uh, Quran. Yeah. Desperation stakes are hit to you now, you see, because the season is nearly finished, like, yeah. and uh, every fellow wants to try to get as much as he can out of it. But it has fished very well right through this season, really, except for the very warm period, but we just have to get a lot of rain over the last few days now, and it's kind of upset the level of the lake is rising, and that kind of unsettles the fish again, like. Does fishing really, in terms of, it needs kind of just settled conditions preferably, is it? For sea trout, yes. Changeable enough for salmon can be workable, but better if we get kind of more even wind and like in September you could you could cope with very in September the wind can be very light like and you could still have great success with sea trout but in earlier in the year in May and June when you were fishing for sea trout you need it quite a breeze like we have today but hopefully we get one of them to make a mistake <laughs> it's tougher fishing kind of at the back end is it no, well, you see, your lake that there's full capacity of fish in, in it, so you know you should have the big amount of fish in it, like. Uh, generally, you would have more numbers caught in September, like, than you would have earlier on, but the, like, the bigger fish come earlier, like, and. and um, you said September was very good this year. Oh, well, it has been fierce good article, yeah. Suffice to say, there were no fish caught by me that morning. 
Neil did catch a few small brownies, but the sea trout remained elusive, as did most of the rest of the lake and the surrounding islands and countryside, blanketed as it was in mist and fog. It was more than a soft day. It was a mucky, wet and windy day to be out in the water, and by lunchtime we were heading for the shore again, where I wanted to find out more about the history of Loch Coran from poet Paddy Bush, who explained to me how the fish in the lake, especially the salmon, are interwoven into the mythology and tales of the water itself. Obviously, when you had a pool rich in salmon, you know, now known as Butler's Pool, on Quran, which gives the village its name, now gives the lake its name, the pool itself, and the river. So that, that pool uh, where salmon were easily trapped or caught or netted or whatever way that it was done in the past uh, was very central to the place. And that's reflected in, as I say, that Celtic mythology. Later, when the area was Christianized and St. Finan, or St. Finian as it's anglicized, uh, was the patron saint of the place, founded Church Island uh, on the lake, which is a very important monastic center. The story of his birth, uh, the usual pattern of associating a, a miraculous birth with a saint. The story of his birth is that uh, a salmon came out of the sunset into his mother's womb. Uh, so you had that association with the, the Christian patron saint of the place. And there are a few stories that talk about miraculous uh, meals of salmon appearing when um, Finan had important visitors from the king or had beggars to feed and various things like that. So the imagination reflects the ordinary reality of the life. So the salmon is hugely important and of course the tourism of the place and in fact I think the colonial occupancy of the place uh, were built around the salmon. Quran is the pool, you know, it's just one small pool. And that's what it originally was. The the river, which is now the Quran River, used to be known as the River Feel, now in Nefele, the same as the name in, in North Kerry. Uh, and the lake, as I said, was known as Loch Ligdach, after one of the original Miletian invaders. Uh, I think it, it was really in the century, you know, between the late 16th century and the end of the 17th century that the name changed uh, officially and on maps from Liach to Loch Quran. And when you, you know, if you look at it rationally, why, why, why should the lake be named after just a pool? But I think it reflected the fact that uh, colonial powers, particularly Cromwellian, times uh, now owned the fishery. The Gaelic mythology and whole history of the lake and the origin myth of the Gaelic people was of no interest to in them. They possibly weren't even aware of it. It was the commercial possibilities of the salmon fishing that interested them and they became very important for a few centuries after that and that's what the the lake and the river became known as because it was the commercial fishery which was of interest not a, a, an old Gaelic story. Loch Leach is officially making a comeback uh, in recent times and I think I think it's good to see the two names you, you have that tradition I mean the the famous travel writer Charles Smith, who wrote about the what is it, the ancient and present state of the Kingdom of Kerry in uh, the early 18th century, he talked about it called, uh, he said the lake was called Loch Lee and by some Quran. So in his time, the two names were, were, were still current. And I, I think it's nice that the two names are become current again. As Paddy Bush points out, the commercial value of Quran as a fishery especially the butler's pool, became a focal point around which the village of Waterville then emerged in the 18th century. Waterville gets its name in, in English from Waterville House. It wasn't originally the name of a village. It was the village was named after the house rather than the house was named after the village. Because when the butler family uh, settled there in the 18th century as customs and excise officials to keep an eye on the O'Connells in Derry Nan. The perk that came with it was that they were given the Quran fisheries. They built their house beside the pool so that it was beside the sea, beside the lake, 
uh, beside the river. They called it therefore Waterville House. The village that grew up around that later uh, therefore took the name Waterville. The historical terms Waterville is a relatively recent village. It grew up uh, around tourism and particularly uh, fishing tourism and the cable station. I mean that that's why the parish church in Waterville is you know was originally or the parish church of Drummond uh, was up the valley. Even now the parish church for this part is a mile outside the village. Mm. Uh, there, there wasn't a Catholic church in Waterville itself because it wasn't the centre of the parish. Despite not being interested in fishing himself, the lake holds a fascination with Paddy and he finds himself drawn to it and has often used it as an inspiration for his writings. I know nothing about fishing mm. except, I suppose, maybe in an imaginative way, but I love going out on the lake. You know, I, I keep a boat on the lake. I regularly go out to Church Island uh, you know, which is one of one of my favourite places, or just go for a spin on the lake, particularly go down the river, see the water lilies. I love going over to uh, the sunken castle, which again is, uh, I think, a fascinating place. It was uh, the seat of the McCarthy family, the McCarthy Moors, when they were losing their power to the Norman invaders. Uh, you know, during the 14th century, at least two generations of them made their headquarters on what is now a heap of stones in the lake, but was, um, you know, the, the seat of the McCarthy Moors at what was then the edge of the lake of Loch Caron. And so much so even that there was a poet, famous bardic poet, Goffrey Fionn O'Dalig, Geoffrey O'Daly, who wrote a poem sometime in the mid to late 14th century uh, exhorting um, McCarthy to leave the wildness and savagery of Loch Lidach and go back to Cashel and claim his birthright. In those days it, it was because there, hadn't, there wasn't much of a Norman influence in the place. I mean as far as the establishment, what was becoming the establishment was concerned, uh, th- this was bandit country. It was really accessible only by sea. Uh, you know, th- even today, you know, th- the roads approach through mountain passes. So you can imagine before a road system, uh, this Ivra area was a fairly inaccessible, uh, wild place. And the McCarthy's were really hiding out there and they hid out and Loch Leader. From such wilds, the area did eventually become colonised and anglicised, especially with the arrival of the cable station on Valencia Island. Waterville and Loch Coran was opening up, and the gentry whose main pursuits were fishing and shooting began to arrive in numbers, around which the Gillian culture began to develop. Certainly there there were um, people and indeed whole families, you know, almost dynasties of of Gillies, if you like, um, uh, and this was very much part of the, the social and e- economic um, fabric of, of the place. I mean, the, the Butler Arms Bar to this day is known as the Fisherman's Bar. And uh, even when I came here, there was, there was a little hatch there where the clients apparently used to send drinks out to their gillies who were in what was um, a fairly basic bar on the outside. Uh, at that stage, I'm glad to see, you know, social circumstances has have changed. So a, a lot of economic power has now moved to the outside, which is a very good thing. The Gillian life has been part of Irish and Kerry culture now for generations. Still serving and guiding Irish and overseas visitors to these shores, Quran has sustained a living for the families for centuries now, with each generation adapting to change.